They were unique. They were revolutionary. They would do for traditional stamp practice what color television did for black and white television. At least, that's what the Postal Service press release said. They were really just first day of issue postmarks, and given that they came out in 2005, it's safe to say that they didn't change the way the average person thought about stamps. But let's take a look at these revolutions and why you might be interested in them. These are digital color postmarks. This is an example of a digital color postmark. It's a laser printed design that cancels a stamp, and these are available for the vast majority of stamps released these days. All of the commemorative stamps get one, and most of the definitives do too. The designs are created either by the artist or art director who designed the stamps themselves, so they should be thematically similar where possible. I've said in a previous video that these digital color postmarks, or DCPs, are the way that I collect new stamps as they come out. Now, this isn't a channel about stamp collecting. It's just not something I feel like I have a lot of expertise on, but there is a natural thought when you start collecting something of getting a complete collection. Obviously, if you're talking about every stamp ever, that's gonna be difficult and expensive. But if you're talking about every stamp starting now, what are your options? A common way to try to collect stamps, at least in the past, was to look for them in the wild, on the mail that you received. If you got one that you wanted to keep, you would soak the corner of the envelope to separate off the stamp, dry it, and then put it into an album or whatever storage situation you had going. But unless you do a lot of letter writing with people who are interested in stamps themselves, it's unlikely you're gonna get a complete collection that way. For one thing, soaking the self-adhesive stamps today is not as easy as the stamps in the past that you licked. It's a different type of glue. Greg over at the Place Stamp Here show has an entire channel about this if you wanna see him investigate it. But beyond that, there are more commemorative stamps per year, even while we're getting less mail with stamps on it. I don't think I've gotten a single letter with one of last year's National Marine Sanctuary stamps on it, but I definitely haven't gotten all 16 of the unique designs. Compare that to the 1950s, where you might get five commemorative stamps released all year, total. All of these challenges are why some collectors put an end date on their collections, only stamps before the year 2000, for instance. Of course, you can build your collection by buying new stamps from the Postal Service directly, but things can start to get expensive. The standard unit of sale for commemorative stamps is the sheet, or more technically the pane, where 20 is the normal count per sheet. Meaning if you want one Toni Morrison stamp, you'd need to spend $12.60 to get 20 of them. Granted, if you like Toni Morrison in particular, you can store away your one stamp for your collection and use the other 19 for sending mail. But if you want to get every stamp, those extras pile up. You can try asking the clerk at the postal counter for a single stamp of a design you like, but they don't have to break a sheet for you. Another option is to wait. At the end of every year, the Postal Service offers its stamp yearbook, which is a hardcover book that goes over all the releases from the previous year. The price will vary year by year, but 2022's was $95, which also includes one of each of the commemorative stamp releases from that year. If you want every new stamp from the year, you can add in the separate high value mail packet and the mail use packet to get the definitives. Again, the price is gonna vary depending on what was released over the year, but those three releases for 2022 came to a total of about $187. And for that, you get $110 worth of postage and the hardcover book. So it's not at cost, but it's better than some of the other options. It's the approach I use to make my own custom saver cards, like the ones the Stampers program produced back in the late 90s. If Stampers saver cards are meaningless to you, I made a video about them. The downside of the yearbook approach is that buying new stamps becomes a once a year event, and what's the fun in that? Another option is the one that I use. I buy first day covers from the USPS.com store. A cover in this case is just a piece of mail with canceled postage on it. If you want the cheapest option available, the standard black and white postmarks currently cost just 55 cents per stamp over the cost of the stamp itself. Like I said, I opt for the digital color postmarks when they're available, which are $1.40 over postage costs. Shipping will add a little bit to the price, but you can make your purchases once every month or two and reduce things a bit. Or you can wait till the end of the year and buy the complete year set from the USPS at once. But again, what's the fun in that? One complication with covers is that it takes more room to store an envelope than just a single stamp. Companies do produce albums for them though. Actually, that's what this stack is behind me in every video. It's not just decoration. I've got an album for each year and I started doing complete coverage back in 2018. 
I'll admit that I've always ordered DCPs off of the Postal Service's website. That's not true of standard first day postmarks. I used to prepare covers myself and send them off to get canceled. But like I said before, that got expensive. I've actually still got a couple Henry James three ounce stamps from 2016 kicking around in my junk drawer. Getting the standard black and white first day postmarks is pretty easy and it's free, at least beyond the cost of stamps. I mentioned in my video about how to get special event postmarks that the process was the same for first day of issue postmarks, and it is. The basic process is to put a stamp on basically any type of thing that can be sent as mail, like an envelope or postcard, address it to yourself, and put that inside another envelope that you send off into the world. The only differences from the special event postmarks is that with those, you can use any stamps you want, as long as it's enough to send it through the mail, but for the first day of issues, you have to use the stamp that goes along with the cancel. Trust me on that, they'll send your cover back with a polite note and no postmark if you send the wrong stamps. Another difference is that even though stamps have first day of issue cities, just like special event pictorial postmarks happen in specific places, you don't send your covers to those cities anymore. That used to be the case, and actually back in the old days, you had to get your postmark on the first day of issue. That's not the case today. I don't know if the general public realizes that or not. In some cases, you are able to send envelopes and money in advance, and the postmaster there would attach the stamp and cancel it for you remotely, but it also created a business opportunity for stamp dealers who had the means to travel to the events, since the post office didn't sell covers to themselves directly, like they do now. In 1977, things changed. The USPS put a 15-day grace period on first-day cancels so that people could buy the stamps, put them on covers, and mail them to the cities to get the cancels. That 15-day period has expanded over time. Just five years ago, it was 60 days, but in 2018, they lengthened the deadline to 120 days. So yeah, you can get a first day of issue four months after the first day of issue. At some point, the first day of issue cities also stopped canceling the covers themselves. There was a stretch of time where they would receive the requests, but they'd bundle them up and send them off to Kansas City, the dumb one in Missouri, not the one in Kansas, which is where the Postal Service's Stamp Fulfillment Services Center is and its cancellation services office. Weirdly, those offices are in a giant underground mine. That's Missouri for you, I guess. Anyway, they were the ones actually doing the canceling. If you were a high volume customer, you could send it directly to Kansas City, but if you were an average person just wanting a few postmarks, you had to go through that lengthy middleman process. That all changed in 2016, and now all first day requests get sent to the same address. But again, I've been talking about the standard postmarks. What about the digital color postmarks? Why haven't I done them myself before? Well, when they were first introduced, you couldn't get your own. Not that I was collecting then. The first stamps with the DCP were the first stamps of 2005, the Lunar New Year set. These could be a video in themselves. 2004 was actually the end of the first 12-year series of these, one per year, and 2005 was a collection of all the previous designs. Since then, we've gone through another 12-year cycle, and we're currently in the third one and each cycle is related in its designs. 2023's was this Year of the Rabbit stamp. I have the DCP, believe it or not. But at the time, you could only purchase the postmarks from the Postal Service directly. This was, for obvious reasons, unpopular with stamp dealers. There were actually grim predictions of this being an effort that would lead to the Postal Service monopolizing the first day cover market. The first day market has kind of collapsed, but it's probably not because of this. Just a couple years later, in 2007, the Postal Service opened DCPs up for people to send their own covers in. But there are more restrictions on what's accepted, which kind of makes sense. The old school postmarks were stamped by hand, and the new ones go through a machine. You can read through the requirements in the Postal Bulletin. I've put a link to them in the video description. Scroll to the end of any issue to get to the postmark section. First of all, DCPs need number 6 or number 10 envelopes. Like I said, with the standard first-day postmarks, you can kind of use whatever you want. Luckily, these are two of the most common envelope sizes, although number six is usually labeled as number six and three quarters. Number sixes are by far the most common for first-day covers. They're what you get when you order from the Postal Service. The envelopes should be laser safe, which makes sense. The postmarks are laser printed. What follows are details about what paper the envelope should be made out of, which I'll admit has been interesting for me to try to understand. For instance, the first recommendation is for envelopes made of 80 pound paper. I had no idea that there were multiple systems for rating pounds for paper. If you search for 80 pound paper on Amazon, for instance, you almost certainly will get results for cardstock, which is 80 pounds cover weight. 
80 pounds text or book weight, which based on the Postal Service's covers is what they're referring to, is more like 32 pound bond weight, which is the more common unit for paper. Metric that's something like 120 grams per square meter. Next in the recommendations is accent opaque, acid free, 9 16th inch seams with no glue on the flap. Now they're obviously thinking of a very specific product here. Acid free makes sense. That's the standard for paper products that are for archival collector type uses. Accent opaque, 9 16th inch seams, that's a bit narrower. No glue on the flap seems like it wouldn't be tied to a specific product, but do a search for envelopes with no glue. It's not a common feature. There are probably other places to buy envelopes that fit all of those recommendations, but the only one I've seen so far is a small site called Carl's Covers. I've got a link to that in the description. With all that said, these are recommendations. The envelopes I used were the ones I used for all my other covers, which I bought off of Amazon for pretty cheap. Granted, not dirt cheap. These aren't 32 pound weight, but they are 24 pound. But there is glue on the flap and I didn't have any issues with them. Another additional requirement for DCPs is that you need to send a couple of blank test envelopes of the same type as the ones you want postmarked. The upside is that if these fail to work in their printers, they won't run your stamped ones through and ruin them. The description makes it sound like they'll use the standard black and white postmarks instead and will return the payment you sent for the DCPs. Oh yeah, that's right. Did I mention the payment? Digital color postmarks aren't free. They're 50 cents a piece. Also, there's a minimum order you have to send, at least 10 of them. And actually, that minimum is probably the main reason why I haven't done these myself, not the cost. It might make more sense if I had some collector friends or a stamp club where we could share the returned covers, but you can see why it might make more sense to just buy a single one from the Postal Service's site. But for this video, and for the experience, I decided to finally do it. Again, you're limited to stamps released in the previous four months, which in early March, when I was setting this up, limited me a bit. Three of the options were way more than I wanted to spend on this. One was the new $10 definitive design, and the other two were the new priority mail designs, one worth $9.65 and the other $28.75. I love the current priority mail series, and I'm absolutely going to do a video about them soon, but remember that the minimum order is 10, so I'd have to spend at least $100, if not $300, to use them here. If I'm going to put in the work and expense for these, I might as well do some art for them. I've mentioned these before. It's really common when getting a special postmark to include a cachet on the cover, which is a little design off to the left of the envelope or card. I've also mentioned that I have no real artistic skills myself, so I wanted to choose stamps where I could do simple designs in Photoshop with something I could pull from online. This led me to doing these for two stamps. The first was the women's soccer design. The Women's World Cup is coming up this summer, and we know the 32 countries that have qualified. So I decided to do a tournament logo and a single country's flag for all 32. The other one was the Toni Morrison stamp, and I decided to use the first edition covers of her 11 novels as my caches. That is one of the cool things about preparing covers yourself. If you purchase through the USPS, you won't get any cover art at all. If you're really into one of the stamp subjects that gets released, you can make something special for yourself to commemorate it. I actually also did some love stamps just to see what a DCP looked like on a number 10 envelope. You get a lot more room for art with these, but like I said, the number sixes are so standard it just seems weird to have this. In terms of sending these off, it's more or less the same as the three envelope approach I mentioned in my special events postmark video. The only difference is that the third envelope is larger because I have more covers. To briefly recap, I don't address my covers at all. Instead, I fold a stamped 9x12 envelope addressed to myself in half, and along with a check for the amount necessary, put it all into another 9x12 envelope addressed to Kansas City. And here they are. I got the covers for my Toni Morrison and Love stamps back in about a couple weeks, and the women's soccer stamps took about three weeks. At least I hope so on the soccer ones. As of me recording this part of the video, they haven't arrived yet, but if you're seeing B-roll of them, that means they made it in time for the final cut. Hey there, this is me from the future, or I guess the more recent past. Uh, I don't have any footage of the women's soccer stamp because a couple days after filming this part, I got a letter from the Stamp Fulfillment Services office saying that there had been a problem printing those onto my covers. Apparently something was misaligned. Uh, they did offer that if I resent my covers, which I have printed here, uh, they will put new stamps on them, send them back uh, without any extra cost. So I will have those covers. I say in a second, if you want to request them, you can shoot me a letter. 
uh, but I don't have any pictures of them for this video. There's not a huge difference here between what I would have gotten if I bought them online, except that a few of the Toni Morrison covers sort of have a double exposure thing going on, like the DCPs were printed twice and didn't quite line up. I did experiment a little bit with using multiple stamps, which you wouldn't be able to get through the Postal Service shop. I also played with including other stamp designs along with the new stamp, and it works just fine. You see people do stuff like this sometimes if there was an older stamp design that was related to a new release, like multiple statehood anniversary stamps. So hopefully this was informative. Maybe it won't get you to send off for your own DCPs, but check them out next time you're on the USPS.com store. I've also got a lot of these women's soccer and Toni Morrison covers that I've made now. If you want one, shoot me a letter and I'll send you one back. The address is at the end of the video, which is now. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out some of the other ones on this channel. Most stamp sets get the same DCP across all the stamps, but there are exceptions, like the Star Wars droids release from a couple years ago. That's right, Gonk Droid has his own DCP.